if you can just get him to say something. It may not even be what you want to hear. If you can just get him to say something, at least you know that he heard you. I, I, don't, I don't know who I'm preaching to this morning, but the Lord sent me here to tell you, he heard you. <laughs> yeah, he heard you. Everybody else wants to send you away, but the Lord turned his head to say, you may be wrong, but I heard you. You may be weak, but I heard you. You may be in trouble. This is the potter's touch. Greetings, brothers and sisters, in the name of Jesus Christ, our King. I am so blessed and so excited to have the opportunity to share the word with you. I'm excited about the word. I still get excited about the word. Been preaching 37 years. I still love his word. I love what it does in your life and in your heart. I love how it strengthens you. I love how it helps you. I've got a message that I believe you are going to love. Take a look. He has passed by the upper coast of Tyre and Sidon. He's come to the coast. He's come to the edge. He's come to the border. I thank him for being the kind of God who will come to the edge. Not just simply a God who stays in the center. He goes to the edge and on the border he finds a Canaanite woman. A woman of Canaan who comes to him. Evidently she has traveled some distance to see him. And she says to him, Lord, have mercy on me. Notice the way in which she approaches the master. She does not come in arrogance or hostility. She does not come in frustration. She does not come with visions of grandeur, but humbly she comes before him, almost as if she knows that he knows something about her. <laughs> You know, people pray differently when they're guilty. <laughs> I know you got to sit there and act like you don't know what I'm talking about, but, but when you come before God and you know you haven't been doing what's right, there ought to be a certain spirit of humility where, where you, you, she didn't come to him and just mention her request. She knew she had no right to speak to him at all. First of all, in the, the custom of the times, for a woman to come and speak to him was inappropriate anyway. Jesus lived in a time that women were not treated as they are treated today. They were treated as second class citizens, denied opportunities, rights and rituals in the sociological times demanded that she take a back seat and defer and acquiesce to him because if nothing else, he was a man and a priest at that. She was a woman and a Canaanite woman. A Canaanite woman means that she comes from an idolatrous background, a woman of Canaan. She was not necessarily a spiritual or holy woman and yet she had a need and she knew where to take it. What do you do when your background doesn't line up with your faith? <laughs> yeah, yeah. When, when I can't look at your history and determine your destiny, when, what do you do when you know that you've been on the wrong side of the tracks and yet you come to Jesus expecting something from him? There is an invisible character here that is never mentioned, not expressed, only implied. I want to take a moment and thank God for that invisible character because as a woman of Canaan, she shouldn't have even known about Jesus, but somebody told this woman about Jesus. They took the time to tell her that there was a man in the city who was giving sight to the blind. He was healing the sick and raising the dead. And this person had to have faith because why would you tell a, a woman of Canaan about Jesus when Canaanites were Gentiles and Gentiles were excommunicated from the commonwealth of Israel, but they told her what seemed like wasted words, but they stuck. Sometimes you'll share your faith with somebody who seems to pay it no attention and it seems like wasted spit and wind, but you don't know when you sow a seed how long it will take to yield a harvest. 
Maybe when they told her there was nothing wrong in her life and maybe she just kind of shrugged it off and said, hmm. But then when her daughter was vexed with the devil, she said, it's my daughter, Jesus. Grievously vexed, not just vexed with the devil, but grievously vexed with the devil. She didn't bring it up at first because she knew she had no rights. Have mercy on me. Thou son of David. Now notice when she calls him the son of David, she calls him by his messianic name. She says, I know you are the Messiah for the children of Israel. So I approach you understanding that I have no rights. I haven't been living right. I don't serve you. I'm not clean. I'm not good. I'm not moral, but I'm desperate. Oh, it's dangerous to fool with a desperate individual. It's a, uh, you, you talk about how tough you are. I, I'd rather fight tough than fight desperate any day. You might look up and beat somebody tough, but when you fight somebody desperate, desperate people will do stuff that's not in the rule book. They'll hit you in places that you didn't even know. Somebody could hit desperate people will go to the limit. This was a desperate woman. Have mercy on me, thou son of David. She cried after Jesus. Jesus. I, I love the fact that she approached him in a spirit of humility, not, not arrogantly, but humbly saying, Lord, have mercy on me and I know you are the Messiah. I know you are the son of David. And she, he says, I am not come but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He said, you have asked me to do something that is a contradiction to my theology. It is inappropriate that I would minister unto you because I'm on a mission and my mission is to go after the lost sheep of the house of Israel and you're not even in the house. Have you ever been blessed outside of the house? <laughs> All you deep folks, you can't ever even admit that you been outside of the house, but I know what it is to be wrong as two left shoes and God bless me anyway, a ridiculous blessing. I, I couldn't even believe that I could be out of the house. And I am not come but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He says, you've asked me to do something that, that is inappropriate because I am on a mission to come to the lost ship. I'm sorry about your daughter. I'm so sorry about that. But it would be the equivalent of you asking uh, an insurance company to cover a car wreck where you didn't have a policy. No matter how bad the accident is, if you're not covered by the policy, you can't expect them to offer up the benefits. She's asking for benefits for which she has no coverage. <laughs> and he said, I am not come but to the lost sheep of Israel. Now they asked Jesus to send her away without even communication. Say nothing to her, just tell her to go. But he started talking to her. Oh, if he ever starts, if you can just get him to say something, it may not even be what you want to hear. If you can just get him to say something, at least you know that he heard you. I, I, I don't know who I'm preaching to this morning, but the Lord sent me here to tell you, he heard you. <laughs> yeah, he heard you. Everybody else wants to send you away, but the Lord turned his head to say, you may be wrong, but I heard you. You may be weak, but I heard you. You may be in trouble. When she knew that he heard her, she got excited. She got all happy. He may not have said what I want him to say, but at least I know he heard me. And if he can hear my problem, 
then he can hear my praise. And I don't know nothing about Jesus. I don't know nothing about him, but I heard them church folks say that, that if God did have a weakness, if he did have a weakness, I'm not saying he does, but if he did have a weakness, it would be praise. So, so since I don't have no rights, I'm just going to get down here and She said, I don't have nothing to lose. The problem is the problem anyway. Me complaining about it didn't make it any better. Crying about it didn't make it any better. Being angry about it didn't make it any better. I'm going to try something new. So she got out in the floor and she said, hallelujah. Still to come on The Potter's Touch. She said, I'll take the leftovers and I'll do more with the crumbs than they did with the whole loaf. I want to talk to people in this room. You don't have a whole lot going for you. You try to make people think you do, but you don't really have a whole lot going for you. Somebody across from you got a whole loaf of talent and blessings and degrees, but all you got is a crumb, but you know how to work that little crumb you got. Discover that despite life's challenges, you are gifted and highly favored. Stirring up gifts in others around the world is a big part of what our ministry does. Discover how your God-given talents can truly bless others, yourself, and the Lord in gifted and highly favored. Abiding in your calling, reaching the level of your gifting, and being fulfilled at that level without being jealous of people who have a greater level of gift. The young people say, get in where you fit in. I think that's the critical part of understanding being gifted. We would like you to have the stimulating three-part DVD series, Gifted and Highly Favored. Just visit our website or call 1-800-BISHOP-2 to receive these inspiring messages. Allow God the opportunity to develop your gifts and increase your favor for a better tomorrow today. The thing that you were created to do, the thing that gives you pleasure, the thing that makes you get up out of the bed in the morning, the thing that makes you willing to stay up all night trying to find it, refine it, and organize it, that's, that's your gift. It's fueled by purpose and by destiny. She started, she started worshiping him. I'm gonna tell you something, never underestimate a worshiper. You looking at the woman talking about, oh, she got a nerve, I praise the God. She had a baby out of well, I know he's not trying to praise the Lord. I remember him, he used to be a bartender down in the club. I know she's not trying to praise the Lord. She used to flirt with my husband, shut up! Because praise! will turn things around. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. All of you little goody two-shoe folk, you don't understand what I'm talking about, but it's some folks in here that you know that it didn't look like you would be where you are right now, but when all hell was breaking loose, praise turned everything around. She said, Lord, help me. Somebody say, Lord, help me. I I, I can't do this by myself. I I did everything that I know how to do. I I, I took a temperature. I checked a fever. I I did home remedies. I I touched her. I encouraged her. I sent her to therapy. I got her some counseling. And she's still grievously vexed. Well, Lord. Help me. Help me. I know I'm not in your house. I know I'm not of the seed of Abraham. I know I'm not a part of the holy folk. I'm not holy, but help me. I'm not righteous, but help me. I've always served you, but help me. I've read my Bible in a month, but help me. I ain't been to church since last year, but help me. I haven't sought your face for a long time, but I'm in trouble and I need you to help me. And it's almost like, it's almost like he's not talking to her. It's almost like he's, he's in a dilemma because he won't to. Mm. 
you have to know that God wants to help you. He said, I want to help you, but, but you, you're not in the family. You're not in the house, and you're not one of the children. And he, he, would, he, he said, it's not right. To get, can you imagine why Jesus talked to her? Philip is touching Thomas and said, why are you even talking to her in the first place? We need to be on down the road going to somebody really ready to receive something from the Lord. But he, but he kept on talking to her. I don't know who I'm preaching to this morning. But in the midst of controversy and confusion, when other people throw their hands up and walk away, the Lord keeps on talking to you. He may not be pleased, but he's still talking to you. And he said, it's not meat for me to give the children's bread to the dogs. Now, he said, it wouldn't be right for me to feed you when I got children over there who need the bread too. Now that might sound bad till you think about it. You, you know, years ago, folk used to invite company over and they feed the company and the kids didn't have nothing to eat. There's something wrong with that, you know. I tell my kids, you can always, daddy guy, you can always eat. I don't feed nobody, not feed my own child. I'm gonna feed my children. If anybody gets down and they got to eat chicken wings, it's gonna be the company my kids gonna eat. You gonna eat, cause you my children. That's all he's saying. That's all he's saying. He said, I'm gonna take care of my kids. Woo, y'all missed it. Daddy said, I'm gonna take care of my kids. He said, I'm not going to give it to you until I give it to them. Well, she didn't know nothing much about Jesus, but she knew something about his kids. When kids are raised with too much, they get wasteful. See, 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 when, 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 <laughs> when people are used to stuff, they take it for granted. And the preacher, the hardest church to preach in is the church that's gotten used to you. Because the same folk that would have ran over somebody to get in here are now talking about, I don't know whether I'm going to church or not. You're fat off the word of God. And God is moved by hunger. And he that hungers and thirsts at the righteousness shall be filled. You ain't gotta be right. You just gotta wanna be right. Lord, I'm hungry. She said, all right, she said, okay, you gonna feed your kids, okay? Feed your kids. She said, let me tell you what I know about your children. Your children waste. Your little finicky, uppity, self-righteous children waste enough to heal my daughter. Did you hear what I said? You waste enough glory to raise Lazarus from the dead. You waste, all, I mean, even opportunities like this. Those of you that sit up there with your teeth in your mouth looking all straight, you waste opportunities that somebody who's hungry for God said, Lord, if I can get to that church right there. She said, she said, go ahead and feed them. She said, I'll take the leftovers. She said, I'll take the leftovers and I'll do more with the crumbs than they did with the whole loaf. I want to talk to people in this room. You don't have a whole lot going for you. You try to make people think you do, but you don't really have a whole lot going for you. Somebody across from you got a whole loaf of talent, 
and blessings and degrees, but all you got is a crumb, but you know how to work that little crumb you got. Touch your neighbor and say, I don't have much. It's just a little bit. But I'm going to work the little bit that I got. Pray them for the little bit God gave you. Pray them for the little bit God gave you. Pray them for the little bit. I don't have what you got. I wish I did look better. I wish I did know more. I wish I did have more. But hey, hey, look at what I did with what I got. I'm going to take 30 seconds and let all the folk who made it off of crumbs give God a praise in this. I made it on crumbs, I made it on crumbs, I made it on. I didn't have this, I didn't have that, didn't have a job, didn't have a husband, didn't have a degree, didn't have a friend, but look at what I did on a crumb. Woo! This is not a dance for the people who got a loaf. This is a dance for the people who got a crumb. Give God a praise for the crumb you got left. Hey! Made it! Didn't know my father, but I made it. Part-time job, but I made it. Raised the kids by myself, but I made it. Hey! We'll be right back right after this. Discover that despite life's challenges, you are gifted and highly favored. Stirring up gifts in others around the world is a big part of what our ministry does. Discover how your God-given talents can truly bless others, yourself, and the Lord in gifted and highly favored. Abiding in your calling reaching the level of your gifting and being fulfilled at that level without being jealous of people who have a greater level of gift. The young people say, get in where you fit in. I think that's the critical part of understanding being gifted. We would like you to have the stimulating three-part DVD series, Gifted and Highly Favored. Just visit our website or call 1-800-BISHOP-2 to receive these inspiring messages. Allow God the opportunity to develop your gifts and increase your favor for a better tomorrow today. The thing that you were created to do, the thing that gives you pleasure, the thing that makes you get up out of the bed in the morning, the thing that makes you willing to stay up all night trying to find it, refine it, and organize it, that's, that's your gift. It's fueled by purpose and by destiny. The prayer that you're trying to articulate, he already understands. 
the condition that you can't find the words to describe. God already knows. For helping us reach others with your gift of any size, you will receive Stuck at a Crossroads on CD. Just visit our website or call 1-800-BISHOP-2 to get yours. I don't want religion. I want relationship. I want connection. I want to be hooked up with the one who died for me. I want the power of God to break loose. And when your gift is $70 or more, we will give you all three life-altering messages from Crossroads, your path to resurrection power and life on DVD. You can put me out of the building, but you can't put me out of the kingdom. Jesus paid it all. However, when your gift is $170 or more, we will add this unique amplified topical reference Bible to the Crossroads DVD and the Blessing of Grace promise cards. I lifted up and I looked down. Mom was in one room, you were in another room yelling at God. I think that it is the brevity of life itself that makes every second so important. And I think that heaven is for real not only reminds us about heaven, but it reminds us about earth as well. That whatever you want to say to someone, you should say it now. And when you love someone, you should love them now. Because so many times we bury inside of ourselves things we would like to say, thinking we'll have another day. And I have learned from personal experience that tomorrow is not promised to you. We need to get him in surgery right away. The pain that I suffered watching my son that close to death. We're in trouble here. He's much worse. Will you call some friends and pray for him? The hospital staff said that your son was not expected to survive. Use the word miracle. Your son had a near-death experience. He saw things that I can't really explain. I said, Lord, how are we going to do this? He said, do you remember? When I fed the 5,000 with two fish and five loaves of bread, and I blessed it, and I broke it, and I gave it to them, and the more I blessed it, and the more I broke it, the more it got multiplied. I said, yeah, Lord, I remember that. He said, well, also remember this. When I got through serving everybody, I had 12 (laughs) baskets full left. And he said, I'm going to send you to gather the leftovers. I'm going to give you leftover people. I'm going to give you leftover property. I'm going to give you leftover businesses. I'm going to give you leftover opportunities. I'm going to give you stuff that other folk threw away. And they said it wasn't going to be anything. He said, but never step over the leftover, son. The miracle is always in the leftovers. I'm out of time, I've got to stop there, but it's been a real joy, a precious joy, a deep and fortifying blessing to share the word of the Lord with you and to be an instrument to encourage you. I pray he used me well, and I pray you become all that God has called you to be. And I pray above everything else that you do not quit, for you are closer now than when you first believed. God bless you. Hold on.